Good morning. It is Friday uh, 15th at 8.30 in the morning, and I've got today's, well, I should say this week's PowerPoint lecture for you, and it's about the how the little colonies grow up. And I want to start first by talking about Plymouth Colony, which uh, Cape Cod's about to get hit by a hurricane if you've followed the news. Uh, the Plymouth Colony is where the pilgrims are going to settle, and that would be north of what is today Boston. And it's settled by a group of Calvinists. Uh, Calvinists, you know them better as Presbyterians or Puritans. The pilgrims were a branch of Calvinists or a type of Presbyterian. And they leave the Church of England. They leave England completely because they want to live their own version of Christianity. They come over on the Mayflower. And the Mayflower had about 100 people on it, but really only 30 of them were pilgrims. Uh, the pilgrims were in the minority on the Mayflower. And because of this, the other 70 or so people who were on the Mayflower were really worried that they would have to convert to the way the pilgrims believed and lived. To guarantee their freedom, the pilgrims and the non-pilgrims signed something called the Mayflower Compact before they even get to Plymouth Rock. And the Mayflower Compact is going to give them religious freedom and also serve as a form of early government for them, too. When the pilgrims arrive, things don't quite happen the way you might have heard for, um, like, the first Thanksgiving or anything like that. Uh, people with bucket hats didn't sit around and, and eat a bunch of turkey. It was actually a really, really hard time. Uh, they arrive in November and December, so it's cold and snowy and, and just miserable. And you only have about 50 or so of the people surviving the first year. It's half of them die. Uh, the pilgrims do receive some help from a local Native American tribe. And all of this is documented by a guy named William Bradford who writes a book called Of Plymouth Plantation. And he documents the history of the pilgrims before they come to America. He documents the history of the pilgrims when they come to America. And he even tells us what happens to all 100 people who are on the Mayflower. So um, we have very good documentation as far as what's going on there. There's another colony. This is the one that is in the Boston area. And I just misspoke. The Plymouth was south of what Boston would be today. Uh, Massachusetts Bay is actually Boston. And it's settled by people we consider Calvinists as well, but they're more mainstream Calvinists. They are not quite as radical or out there, so to speak. They still wanted to purify and change the church, but they didn't want to go to the extremes as the pilgrims. They're led by a guy named John Winthrop, who's got about 700 middle-class families with him. And he famously writes and gives a sermon called A Model of Christian Charity before his group gets to the New World. And A Model of Christian Charity is really going to set out his vision for the colony. Uh, it's going to be godly. It's going to rely on the, the Christian version of charity, meaning it's not going to be a profit-driven community. And he very famously says that his new colony will be a shining city on a hill, meaning he thinks his way is the best and it's going to survive and be the model that others should settle with. What do these New England colonies look like? It uh, doesn't matter if the, it's the Pilgrims or the Puritans, they're all going to set up kind of the same because they're centered on the idea of the Congregationalist Church. Uh, the church is going to be in the middle of town, Membership in the church is required. Attendance at the church is required. And then giving money to the church is required too. All the public meetings happen at the church. The public officials are all usually going to be leaders of the church. And church and state are technically separate, but in reality they're not because they're so closely intertwined. In a family setting... Uh, the husband is the head of the family. Everybody is supposed to respect him. Women are basically viewed as children. And the population is going to grow pretty rapidly because there's an even number of males and females. So there's 
natural population growth that's going to occur. Not everybody's happy with the way things are going in the Massachusetts Bay Colony or the Plymouth Colony. I've got the name of three dissenters here. Uh, Roger Williams is the most famous of them. Uh, he thought that church and state should be separate no matter what, and he opposed the idea of mandatory church attendance and mandatory giving. So he's going to purchase land from the Narragansett Native American group, and he's going to found his own colony that's known as the Providence Colony, which we know better today as Rhode Island. Now, why does he do this? Because the leaders of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, they uninvite him. They say, you need to get out. You also have Anne Hutchison. She believed in the idea of salvation of grace, meaning it's just enough to ask for forgiveness. You don't actually have to work for it. Uh, very much in line with the ideas of Martin Luther versus the Catholic Church or the Puritans at the time. She is banished from the Massachusetts Bay Colony because she believes in female participation in public life and in women being allowed to preach, which was a big no-no at the time. And she actually developed a, f a group of followers who would attend sermons that were led by her, and she was kicked out for doing that. In the end, <clears throat> she lives in what would be today either Manhattan or Long Island, one of the two. And there's a Native American raid on the settlement she's in, and she is killed. And when word of this gets back to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, they basically say it's what she deserved because she was working for the devil. Last but not least, Quakers and Baptists. Uh, these are two religious groups that were brand new at the time. And if you were living in a Congregationalist or a Puritan setting, and you were a Quaker or a Baptist, you could be banished and forced to live on your own, or you could just be straight up executed for it because it was not allowed. Uh, Salem Witch Trials. I'm just going to briefly talk about these. Um, they're going to happen in 1691 and 1692 in the city of Salem. Uh, Salem, Massachusetts is a suburb of Boston today. And you have two children, uh, Betty Paris and Abby Williams, who are going to claim to hear voices and be turned to a witch by their household slave named Tituba. When the parents of Betty Paris and Abby Williams take them to a doctor, the doctor's name is William Griggs. William Griggs gives them a medical evaluation and diagnoses them with bewitchment. So then there's a literal witch hunt that happens, and the parents say, who did this to you? And three women are going to be blamed initially. There's Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, and Tituba. Tituba is the family slave of Betty Paris. Uh, supposedly, Betty and Abby had their fortunes read by Tituba, and that's where the bewitchment happened. Sarah Good was a poor woman who... Um, she um, had a couple of kids, and then Sarah Osborne is going to be a homeless woman as well. Before you know it, Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, Tituba start pointing out other people, and then those other people, to try and save themselves, point to more people, and before you know it, there's this whole mob happening where people are just accusing each other, hundreds are going to be arrested, and there are more than 30 hanged for being a witch. In the end, the girls confess it's all made up, and they and their families are banished from the colony. This is one of the last major instances of witches, or witch hunts, or witch trials in human history. Uh, witch trials have been going on since the 1200s in Europe. And then they are pretty much done after the Salem Witch Trials uh, in the 1690s. Now the big question is why did this happen? It turns out that the rye that they used, the, because they used rye bread and uh, uh, rye for their grains, was infected with a fungus called ergot. 
And with ergot, it causes you to have epileptic fits, it causes you to have seizures, causes you to um, do a lot of the things that Betty Paris and Abby Williams were doing. Throwing some more colonies at you here. We got Pennsylvania and Georgia. Uh, the guy on the top right, no, that is not the Quaker Oats man, but he is a Quaker. That is William Penn. William Penn was a member of the Society of Friends, uh, the Quakers as they were known to make fun of them. Uh, they believed in simple living, they believed in pacifism. Their church settings, they had no hierarchy, there was nobody leading the sermons. If you were a member of the Society of Friends, you would sit there and you would meditate, you would read the Bible, and then you would start to quake or shake, if you will, whenever you experienced a um, spiritual breakthrough or felt the inner light, as they said. So they lived very differently and they had some very different beliefs. And because of that, William Penn is going to ask for and be given land for a new colony, which is today Pennsylvania. When William Penn does this, he's going to invite outsiders in. So the Baptists are going to be allowed in, Native Americans are going to be allowed in, and there is true religious tolerance in Pennsylvania. Georgia is founded by the guy on the bottom right. That's James Oglethorpe. And James Oglethorpe, he's a product of the Enlightenment, where people start to worry about equal rights and equality and prison reform and treating equal everybody better. And he's going to create Georgia for two reasons. Number one, to prove that a society based on equality could work. And number two, to get people who are in debtors' prisons out and a second chance at life. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, when Georgia was founded, uh, the city of Savannah is going to be the city that is personally designed by James Oglethorpe, which is why there are squares there. He's going to limit the land holdings. You can only get so much land, but also you cannot buy or sell land. So you get what you're given and you're stuck with it. Alcohol is banned, slavery is banned, and unfortunately, James Oglethorpe's um, experiment is gonna fail by 1750, and Georgia is going to revert back to a crown colony and the crown, the king, is going to directly take control of Georgia. During the 1700s, population is going to explode and uh, roughly 650,000 immigrants are going to come to the New World. About half of those are going to come against their will and that's because they're slaves. On top of the immigration, you also have natural population growth. You have marriages that happen early you have frequent births. If you're a woman, you're having a kid about every two years. And their mort mortality rates are going to start to lower. Who are the people coming over from the old world to the new world? You got Scots-Irish, you got the Scots, and then you have Northern English. They're going to come after 1720. And then Germans are going to start coming over after 1750. You also get some competition between England, France, and Spain, and this is going to affect the Native American population because if you have a Native American population, they're going to go to England and ask for stuff, and there's going to be a deal made, but then they go to France, or leaders of France or representatives of France, and say, hey, England's going to give me X, Y, Z, and then France will try to outdo them. The other part of this is the Europeans are going to use the native populations against each other to fight wars and things like that. As far as slaves go, there are about 325,000 slaves brought from Africa to North America. And almost as soon as slavery starts in North America, there are people who are against it. And there are even rebellions. There's a rebellion in New York City in 1712. And then the Stono Rebellion happens near what is today Charleston in 1739. The daily life, um, you have to really think of it through the ideas of the Enlightenment where you start to ask questions, you start to want representative government, uh, the idea of capitalism is growing. So the Enlightenment is going to shape the way the colonists think. Um, the idea of self-rule or local rule is a big deal and that starts almost from the beginning of the colonies. 
the idea of education, everybody should be educated. And you're expected to learn basic writing, basic reading, basic math. Uh, majority of the women, though, are illiterate because they're only supposed to be seen, not heard. They're kept in the house. And education, even though it's expected of everybody, will become a status symbol. And those that have enough money to be fully educated do so, and they're often sent back to England to complete their education. So we end up with two different cultures. We get this lower class oral culture where all the information is passed by word. Uh, it is often embellished or not completely true. You also get the elite culture, which is well educated, and they're going to be the ones wearing the powdered wigs and doing the large parties. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> You've got Congregationalists and Episcopalians. They're going to worship in a hierarchy, or hierarchy, I should say. So there's a defined leader of the church. There are deacons or elders in the church. And then the families are going to sit and listen to the leaders. What would happen very often in these Congregationalist or Episcopalian churches is that wealthy families would purchase their own pews. And this would mean that the, the lower class people didn't have any place to sit and they would be forced to leave and go and find their own church or create their own church. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, the Quakers are going to have an informal meeting with no leaders. Everybody sits in silence, waiting for that inner light to wash over them. And men and women are allowed to participate in Quaker religious um, traditions equally. A really important religious thing that's going to happen during this time is something called the Great Awakening. And it's led by a guy named Jonathan Edwards and George Whitefield. Now this came from the idea that Christianity had kind of lost its faith and that it was more geared towards greed and thinking. And there was this enlightenment idea called deism, where God was seen as a clockmaker. God put the clock together, put the batteries in, and the world's just spinning around doing whatever it's going to do. And this group of people decide to fight against that idea, and they're going to become members of the Great Awakening. Um, good examples, Jonathan Edwards, uh, his sin Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, which is something you have to read for this week. Uh, the Jonathan Edwards God is not a kind God. It is a vengeful, wrathful God who is holding you in the pit of his hand over fire and is just ready to let you go at any moment. George Whitefield is going to preach much the same, but be a little bit more um, graphic, if you will, to the point that Jonathan Edwards attended <laughs> a Whitefield sermon and thought he was going to go to hell. Um, ben Franklin, who was a known and open atheist, he heard a Whitefield, <clears throat> a Whitefield uh, sermon and gave money to his his church. So. Uh, these guys of the Great Awakening were very effective at the time. All right, politics in the colonies. Um, most of the colonies are going to set up like this, so I, I'm pretty, pretty confident that one slide is enough for you. Uh, each of the colonies is going to have a governor. The governor answers only to Parliament or the king. Uh, helping the governor pass taxes and act as an advisor is going to be the legislature. Most colonies have two houses, which means it is a bicameral legislature. A good example of this is Virginia, which had the House of Commons and the House of Burgesses. Uh, the members of the legislature are going to be elected by landholders. And then uh, county judges are going to be where most of the day-to-day -day business is done. Uh, the county judges, the county uh, constables are going to be the one that you're most likely going to deal with. So as early as the 1700s, uh, the British colonies here in the United States, they're being run primarily with self-government. And that desire for self-government is going to grow from the beginning all the way up until the 1770s when this little thing called the revolution is going to happen. Last but not least, just a quick look at the economics of the colonies. Uh, New England was dependent on the fur trade. 
but eventually it's going to switch to exporting goods to the British Caribbean. The southern colonies are going to do trade directly with England because they're going to export, export foodstuffs to England. And then North America is part of what's called the mercantilist system, which is uh, an economic system where everything is closed. So England wants to do business only with England and the English colonies. France wants to do business with France and only the French colonies. So the, there are laws passed that encourage the English colonies to do business only with the mother country. Uh, they don't always work because the colonists, they just want to make as much money as they can. They don't really care much about how well the English government is doing. So we got... Um, you know, competing economic views here between New England, the southern colonies, and then the colonies in general versus England. All right, the last thing. Uh, for this week, you have to do your first reflection paper if you haven't written it yet. Uh, I apologize, by the way, for this video being a little later in the week. I've been sick and under the weather and haven't been able to talk very well. Uh, so better late than never, and once again, I apologize. Uh, for your reflection paper, what I need you to do is just choose one of the readings we've done so far and give a personal reflection on it. Tell me how you feel about it, what it makes you think when you read it, whether you agree or disagree with the subject. Uh, the important thing is that it is based on your personal reflection, your personal opinion. Uh, make it about a page and a half long, double space it, and for your very first paragraph, your first four or five sentences, just give me a really quick summary of whatever article you've chosen to reflect on. And if you have any other questions about it, just send me an email and I'll be glad to answer it for you. All right, until next time, I appreciate you. We'll talk to you soon.